viewers, it's Wednesday at eight o'clock again, BST. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, you're welcome to watch. And uh, I've got our first biologist. We've had all sorts of people, philosophers, psychologists, uh, organic chemist, a cosmologist. My mind's a blur. I can't remember who I've had and who I haven't now. But today we've got our first biologist. She's a geneticist and it's Dr. Kat Arnie. Hello, Hello. Thank you for having me. Hello, Kat. How the devil are you? I am very good. It's really nice to be here. Nice to get out. <laughs> <laughs> out into the ether. <laughs> yeah. Well, the last time I saw you, you didn't see me, but it was at the science exhibition that the new scientist held a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I, I think I was on one of the stage uh, on one of the stages for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We just walked past and I said, that's Kat to my daughter. Who I, not this daughter, but another daughter. Who I was taking around the exhibition. So how has COVID affected you? Is it Has it uh, cramped your style? Um, yeah, to a certain extent it has. So my job really is as a, a science communicator. So I do writing, broadcasting, a lot of public speaking. Uh, as you will very soon discover, I brought a book out this year. So that has been very tricky. Um, other than that, my other work is I, I run a small communications com company working in the life sciences. And one of our clients has been the uh, Zoe COVID, COVID Symptom Study app. So um, we were working with them already, and then they just built this app in a weekend. So pretty much since March, um, my life has been all COVID all the time, but just yes. very luckily staying at home writing about it and not being able to go out and talk about my book. So, mm, yes. <laughs> so it's all, nice to do this. We've all found a new way of working, haven't we? Yeah, it's been busy. I, I got a copy of your first book, Herding Hemingway's Cats. And you kindly signed it for me. And then my elder daughter made off with it for her collection of author, author signed books. And I haven't seen it since. <laughs> it's somewhere in the house. OK. When I, when I first read the title, I thought, why Hemingway's cats? Which surely Schrodinger's cat would have been harder to herd. Well, this is the thing. I'm not a physicist, so I have no truck with Schrodinger's cats. But yeah, if you read the book, it was the, the Hemingway cats were the inspiration for that book. It was an exploration of how do our genes work. And it's, yeah. it all started when I saw someone speaking about Hemingway cats, which are the cats with thumbs. So yeah, thumb yeah. cats and Ernest Hemingway was very yeah. fond of them. And it's a specific yeah. mutation. And that kind of set me on this odyssey yeah, to, yeah. to write about them and find out more about how our genes work. And yeah, yeah. So, so here we are. <laughs> Well, I've got some links to put in the comments, but I'd like to invite people to start thinking of something to say, because uh, we have an opportunity for them to ask questions. And if they want to do that, I've asked them to put a cue to distinguish it from other comments that they may be making. And uh, so I'll, I'll drop some uh, links to your connections during the program. But I, I think you've got a, a presentation you want to show us? I do. So I'm going to talk uh, probably for about 40 minutes about uh, some some of the ideas in my new book, which is called Rebel Cell, which is a mm -hmm. book about cancer evolution and the science of life. So I'll do that and then we can uh, have some questions in the chat. So shall I, shall I get rolling? Yes, please. I'll permit it when it appears on. It, it comes up sort of ghostly on my screen and then I, I have right. to enable it. Let's make this work. Uh, share screen. Technology. How about that? That's all working. There we go. Excellent. So, um, so yeah, so I'm going to speak about some of the ideas in my new book, which is called Rebel Cell, uh, Cancer, Evolution and the Science of Life. And uh, I obviously don't have enough time in 40 minutes to talk about all the ideas in the book. It's It really was an incredible journey researching and, and writing this book. So I spent 12 years in the science comms team at Cancer Research UK. And when I sat down to write this book, I thought, you know, I know my stuff. I, you know, I spent 12 years doing comms about cancer. I know everything. And I'm just, just going to leave you to it, Kat. Yeah, I'm, sure. I'm going to leave you to it and monitor the comments coming in. OK. Um, and so when I sat down to write this book, I, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and then I just discovered so many things that really made me 
view cancer, this disease that I've I've talked about, and I'm sure every single person listening knows whether it's through our, our own journey or through someone we love, what this disease is like, just learned so many new things. And, and in many cases, things that just absolutely blew my mind. So I will share a few of these things with you and I would love to hear your questions afterwards if there's anything that's that stimulated your thoughts. So the brief topics that I'm going to cover are where did cancer come from and what makes it so difficult to treat effectively and in this particular case I will be talking mostly about advanced cancers that have spread through the body and then how can we beat it? Can we devise cleverer strategies to tackle cancer more effectively? And I really want to start with something positive. Well, depending whether you're a pessimist or an optimist, this is a glass half full or a glass half empty. So we know now that half of all people who are diagnosed with cancer today in the UK will survive for at least 10 years. And that's a figure that has doubled within my own lifetime. So we are making progress in treating cancer and particularly cancers that are diagnosed at an early stage. And there has been a lot of progress in some of the more common cancers, things like uh, bowel cancers, breast cancers, prostate cancers. We've seen big improvements in survival in many of these cases, as I say, particularly cancers that are diagnosed at an early stage. But that's still a glass half empty. And you know, I think that if we're going to fill that glass significantly further, we do need to think about cancer in a new way because some of the ways that we're now moving towards in terms of how we treat cancer and some of the gains in survival that have been brought by some of the very, very, very expensive new therapies that are coming on the market are not moving the needle as much as maybe we've been led to believe that they are. But I do want to start out by, you know, this isn't a book that's me putting on my tinfoil hat and saying, oh, it's all been a waste of time, there's been no progress. We have made incredible progress in understanding cancer, in diagnosing cancer, and in treating cancer, and, and also in the quality of life for, for people living with cancer. But there is so much more that we need to do. And I think it's really important. Uh, I brought out a book about a life-threatening disease in a life-threatening pandemic. The cancer charities, Cancer Research UK, have had huge drops in income during the pandemic. They've had to lay off researchers, they've had to lay off staff. There are thousands of people who may lose their lives as an indirect, of co uh, indirect result of COVID by not being diagnosed with cancer soon enough, by not starting treatment soon enough because of the impact of this pandemic on the health service. So although, you know, it's maybe not something that we want to think about right now, and I've, I've had a lot of people going like, not now, now is not the time. But cancer is always here, it's always with us. And I think in this situation, it is a massive threat, particularly given the impact on cancer services that the pandemic has made. So where are we and where are we going? So the first thing that I wanted to really bust in this book was a myth that it's quite a common misconception that cancer is a modern human disease that's been brought about by our modern, toxic, nasty, unpleasant human lifestyles. And this, frankly, is not true. It simply is not true. Cancer is not just a human disease. Cancer is not just a modern disease. And just to explain, so we find cancer everywhere we look across the tree of life. One of the books that I drew on very heavily researching my book is a, a scientific textbook called The Ecology and Evolution of Cancer. And it's edited by a, a great scientist called Beata Ujvari and her colleagues. And within it, there's sort of, you know, 20, 30 close typed pages detailing all the species that we even know of where cases of cancer have been positively diagnosed. And it's across all branches of the tree of life. What have we got here? We've got Dorcas gazelle, Thompson's gazelle, blue monkeys, military macaws, king parrots, bull snakes, Florida pine snakes, rhinoceros iguana, boon slang, green tree frog, Atlantic salmon, uh, the eastern oyster, and the soft shell clam. We find cancer everywhere we look. So cancer is not just a human disease. And this tells us that it must go very, very deep back into evolutionary time. If all organisms can get cancer, it's something that is to do with biology. It's not to do with humanity. And the story that really blew my mind and illustrated this for me was a paper that came out in 2014, which is about the creature on the right, which is a hydra, 
And these are tiny, tiny organisms that live in the water. And they're little more than a tube of cells with tentacles. They only have three different types of cells in them. They're very, very simple organisms. And in 2014, some researchers brought out a paper showing that they had found a naturally occurring tumor in a hydra, in an organism that simple. It's the simplest, simplest organism where we've ever found evidence of cancer. So this tells us that cancer runs deep, 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 deep within biology and evolution. So we also find evidence going back into the fossil record of cancer. So in fact, with perfect timing, the week in August when my book came out in the UK, there was a story published about a 77 million year old dinosaur fossil where they had found an osteosarcoma, a bone tumor in this fossil. There was a very famous study in 2003 where some American researchers went around all the natural history museums in America with a scanner and were like, can we pop your dinosaurs into our scanner? And they were looking for evidence of cancer because no one had really done that before. You know, it's that classic problem in science. If you don't actually start looking for something, you don't find it. And then often the more you look for something, the more you find. And they found evidence of tumours in dinosaur fossils and particularly a relatively high number in hadrosaurs. These are these uh, duck-billed dinosaurs. And of course, as you might expect, when we go back through the fossil record, through the records of human remains, human populations all over the world through time, going back to deep, deep time, tens of thousands of years ago, we find evidence of cancer. And it's not, and um, you know, some many cancers don't leave marks in fossils. It's some cancers that spread into the bones, they will leave characteristic signatures. Cancers that start in the bones will leave characteristic signatures. But given the fact that we do find cancers, and there's more than 250 well-documented cases of cancer in the ancestral, in the ancient human record, the fact that we find this at all suggests that cancer has always been with us. It's always been a problem that has affected humanity. The problem is that we don't know in the past how common it was, because unfortunately, when you're looking, you know, if you're an archaeologist, we don't uncover beautifully aged, matched, nice representative population samples when we're looking for human remains. You kind of, you, you get what you get and you get on with it. So we don't know how prevalent cancer was. We do know that the risk of cancer significantly increases with age and that most cases of cancer in our population today occur in people over the age of 60. And in the book, I go into quite a lot of detail about the evolutionary reasons why that might be so. And obviously, in the past, your chances of getting into your sixth or your seventh decade were, let's put it like this, a lot lower than they are today. Humans are living in an unprecedented era of access to healthcare, of public health. We are living longer than our species has ever lived. And because, for evolutionary reasons, the risk of cancer does go up after the age of 60, as we get older, there's probably there were fewer cancers in the past. But the fact that we do find them suggests that it has always been with us. It has always been a disease of, of biology and of humanity. Um, there are certainly things we do in our modern lives that don't help. And, uh, you know, I can talk about that a bit more later if anyone's interested. But this is a disease that has always been with us. And that's because cancer is the price of multicellularity. And one of the really fascinating ideas that I came to explore in a lot more detail in, in Rebel Cell in the book is this idea of the rebel cell of cancer cells as cheats emerging out of the society of tissue. And this is a bit of a contrast to some of the ideas we might have about cancer as it's like something, something alien or it's like one cell that's gone wrong. I came to really see cancer as a disease of tissue. Now, let, let me explain the idea of the sort of the society of cells a little bit more. And this is ideas that were first put forward several decades ago and kind of got forgotten as we really focused on the, the genetics, the genetic changes that we know are in cancer cells. We sort of forgot to look at the rest of us. But this idea that's put forward about the society of cells, and, and it's been really reinforced by a woman called Athena Actippus, who's working at Arizona State University, and she studies all kinds of societies, human societies, animal societies, and cellular societies. And she realized that all societies basically adhere to the same kind of rules. 
Some of them enforce them more strictly, some sort of less strictly. But in order for a society to basically function, you have to follow five basic rules. You have to not multiply more than you need to. You have to kind of stop when you're when you're done. You have to do the job that you're meant to do or fulfill the role that you're meant to do. You have to not take more resources than you need because that leaves less for everyone else or none for everyone else. And also you have to like not pollute or mess up the environment around you for everyone else. So this kind of idea of cellular rules, cellular society's rules, this works on the level of tissues. If cells proliferate out of control, that results in cancer. Cancer cells don't die when they should. They pump out lots of nasty toxic chemicals and, and pollute the environment around them. They stop doing the job they're meant to do. You know, skin cells just start wandering off around the body. And, you know, and they take more than they need. They consume a lot of resources. And we can find examples where the genetic changes that we know drive cancer, the mutations, the alterations in DNA, the underlying genetic code in cancer cells, enables them to cheat. Um, I don't have time to go into it here, but there's a lovely story in the book about uh, some cheating amoebas, where even single-celled organisms that come together, they, they can cheat each other based on genetic mutations. So this is a fundamental process of biology, that if you have cells working together in a society, and some of them have genetic changes, then they can become cheats and eventually emerge as cancer. And this was a, a theme that I sort of explored a lot. And it really did, really did blow my mind, because it explains why cancer is not just a human problem, that it goes deep, deep, deep across all of biology, and all the evolution of life. And, you know, here's an interesting question for you. This kept me awake a couple of nights. So given if cancer is basically an emergent property out of our tissues of multicellular life, would aliens get cancer? And I'm kind of thinking like, well, yeah, if they're multicellular and their cells obey the same rules that our cells obey and, you know, can, can break away and, and cheat the kind of instructions, then, yeah, I guess aliens could get cancer. I mean, that's, you know, it's one to discuss, uh, maybe when we're all allowed out to the pub again. But the, uh, the, the other, this sort of leads us to the idea of what is cancer. And in recent years, we've had a very, very reductionist, genetically reductionist view of what cancer is. We focused very, very much on this idea that uh, cancer is a disease that starts when cells pick up genetic mutations, and they multiply out of control. And when I was at Cancer Research UK, I, I can't even remember the number of times I wrote this sentence. Yeah, every time we had to write, what is cancer? It would start, cancer starts when a cell picks up genetic mutations and multiplies out of control. Yeah, great. Um, so we, this sort of leads us to the, uh, what scientists describe as the somatic mutation theory of cancer. And I like to call genetic bingo. So it's this idea that when cells pick up enough genetic changes. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't take one genetic change to turn a cell into a cancer cell. They need to pick up a few. And in different tissues, different types of cancer, it's a different number of changes they need. But this is sort of like, if you've got enough genetic mutations, then you become a cancer cell. And so this is sort of the way that we've thought about cancer for many, 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 many years. It's, it's a very genetically reductionist view. It's driven by what is different and wrong inside this cancer. And then that leads us on to if we can find out what is different and wrong inside these cancer cells, that's how we treat them because we target the things that are different and wrong. And so like, great. And this is the way that cancer research has really focused for at least the past decade, I would say. But there's a problem. And this problem was really highlighted by researchers at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge in a paper they published in 2015. And this really came out of the fact that we now have genetic technology, DNA sequencing technology, that enables us to study genetic mutations at very, very low cost, at very high speed and high depth of, of resolution in tiny, tiny, tiny samples of cells, even down to like a handful of cells now, and in some cases down to a single cell. And we've never been able to do this before. 
Before, genetic sequencing was very expensive. It took a very long time. If you wanted to look at the genetic mutations in, say, a tumor, you had to get a sample of the tumor. You had to mash it up. You had lots and lots of cells, millions and millions of cells in there, and just see what you'd got in there. But now we can really refine what we look at in terms of looking for different mutations, different genetic changes. And so this team is led by uh, Peter Campbell and Phil Jones and Inigo Martin Carena. And what they did was like, well, has anyone looked at normal tissue? Because as scientists studying diseases, particularly like cancer, we tend to just focus on the stuff that's wrong. We look at cancer cells. You're a cancer researcher. You're going to study cancer. I mean, it's a no brainer. So no one had really thought to go, well, what does normal tissue look like? And kind of we knew that as we get older, you know, we must pick up genetic changes, right? You know, everything gets a bit loose as you get older. You know, you do pick up mutations through the hurly burly of life and, and the things that you do in your life and, and all kinds of stuff causes genetic damage. We know this, but no one had really looked at the extent to which this happened. And the first experiment they did was to look at uh, tiny pieces of skin. And the very clever experiment they did, they were trying to find a piece of skin on the body that would have been exposed to UV light. So had a good chance of having picked up some damage because UV light from the sun is very potent uh, carcinogen. It causes DNA damage. But they wanted something that probably wouldn't have been hidden under clothes or have been covered in sunscreen. And the thing that they found was the eyelid. And they got samples of eyelid skin from people who were having uh, operations, cosmetic operations, to remove flaps of skin where the eyelid becomes very droopy and it interferes with vision. And this kind of stuff is just going to go in the bin. And so they went to the surgeons at the local hospital and the patients and said, um, can, can we have your eyeball skin? And they were like, your eyelid skin? And they were like, yes, sure. And so they took these little flaps of skin and they cut them into tiny, tiny, tiny pieces and did. DNA analysis on them. And they found that these patches of skin, every single tiny patch, carried many, many, many mutations, thousands of mutations. And in some cases, these mutations, if we had found them in a cancer, you would say that is a cancer mutation that is driving these cells, these cancer cells. And this was in perfectly normal skin, no signs of skin cancer, perfectly normal skin. And this was mind blowing because, you know, we think of our, our normal tissue like, yeah, you know, it's probably it's probably seen some stuff. It's probably some mutations here and there. But discovering the extent to which normal skin was a patchwork of mutation was was really surprising. And then so they went to look at another tissue. So this uh, this time they went to look at the esophagus, which is the tube that connects the mouth to the stomach. And they were using samples from people who'd passed away in road traffic accidents you know, with the consent of the family to take small sections of the esophagus and do the same thing, cut it into tiny, tiny pieces, and then look at the pattern of genetic changes. And these, uh, these slides we're looking at, I think they're a beautiful graphic representation of what they found. And every circle is a small patch of cells, and every color represents different mutations, different genetic changes that, again, if we found them in cancer, we would say that those were cancer driving mutations. And we're looking from the left to the right in someone in their 20s, people in their 50s, and people in their 70s. And we can see that by the time we're getting into the sixth, seventh decade of life, we are a patchwork of mutation. And I will stress this, a patchwork of mutation, any of which these changes, if we found them in a cancer, we would say that is responsible for driving the cancer. And so this really calls into question the entire model of understanding cancer as a cell that picks up a certain number of genetic changes and multiplies out of control. Because if all our tissues are a mess of mutation, what is special, what is different about cancer cells that enable them to cheat, to emerge, to, to go rogue? Because this is a really interesting conundrum because cancer is rare. And this seems like an incredibly transgressive and almost offensive statement, because one in two people will get cancer at some point in their lifetime. And you're like, that's not rare, shut up, that's incredibly common. I'm like, yeah, it's incredibly common on a population level. 
When you look at the whole population, cancer is common. When you look at your own body, anyone's body, cancer is incredibly rare. We are made of trillions of cells that multiply billions and billions of times in our lifetime, picking up damage to the extent that by middle age to, to older life, we are a complete mess of mutations. Our bodies have seen some stuff. But each one of us may in our entire lifetime only be diagnosed with one, maybe two tumors, actual cancerous tumors. That is incredible. That's one times 10 to the 14, like 10 with 14 zeros after it. It's, it's the world's most shitty lottery, basically. But we know it happens because it's a numbers game at this point. So this is the real conundrum that I kept coming across, is that if so much is kind of weird and messed up in our tissue, what is the trigger? that tips a kind of a sad cell into being a bad cell. And this comes down to not just the specific mutations in genes, but actually the broader picture of the chromosomes. Now, uh, genes are specific, like sort of short stretches of DNA, but chromosomes are the long strings of DNA that are found in all our cells. And humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We get one of each pair from mum, one of each pair from dad, and they multiply in, in every time our cells divide. Every time our cells multiply, our chromosomes are copied and distributed. And this is a representation, this is a technique called uh, chromosome painting or spectral karyotyping of a normal human set of chromosomes. So you've got labeled one to 22. And in this case, uh, this set of chromosomes comes from someone who was genetically female. So they have two X chromosomes. So we've got all like kind of nice array. Each one's painted in a different color. All nice, nice pairs, nice and neat. This is uh, a set of chromosomes from normal human cells. Now, let's look at what happens in cancer cells. So on the right, it's the same technique, uh, slightly different colors, but the same technique has been used to analyze the chromosomes in six different breast cancers. And I think you will agree, there's quite a difference. You know, there are chromosomes that have gone missing. There's chromosomes that have been copied. There are bits that are being cut and pasted, all the colors are mixed and matched all over the place. This is chromosomal chaos. And so it's increasingly looking like what turns a sad cell with specific genetic changes into a bad cell, a cancer cell, is some kind of chromosomal issue. So we don't know exactly what triggers these things. And we also don't know what is the tissue environment that enables these really, really damaged cells to thrive. Because it's not just about the cells and the mutations in the cells. It's also about the tissue environment. Um, and I probably don't have time to, to talk much about it here, but uh, for my money, I think that things like inflammation in tissues is probably going to be the thing that is manipulating the environment that enables cheating cells, damaged cells with these kind of messed up chromosomes to really emerge and become cancerous. And that's because this chromosomal chaos is rocket fuel for evolution. And we're really starting to understand cancers within the body as evolutionary systems. They are evolving, they are changing. It's not just one cell multiplying with the same set of genetic mutations that it's always had. They, these cells are diverging. They're almost like species diversifying, picking up new mutations in this group, multiplying here, picking up new changes here, new characteristics, just trying to survive in the environment that they find themselves in. It's an incredibly potent evolutionary system. I, I sort of, I've heard researchers talking about the crucible of evolution, and I, I prefer to talk about the bin fire of evolution when it comes to cancer. But it's, it's a very powerful, evolving system within the complex system of the body. So this very simplistic model of cancer as a disease that starts when a cell picks up mutations and multiplies out of control is simply not correct. It's a disease that starts, yeah, when cells pick up mutations and they start to multiply. And then within the tissue that they find themselves in, a chromosomal event happens. And within the tissue that they're in, it provides them with an advantage over their neighbors 
allows them to cheat, to cheat the system and emerge as a cancer. And this capacity of cancer to evolve is the biggest challenge that we face in trying to treat particularly advanced cancers. And this is what has been the problem. Because we've, we've fallen into this idea that if we can just find these genetic changes that we think are driving cancers, find the genes, and then design the drugs that target them, the magic bullets, then this will be the way that we treat cancer. And the poster child for this approach is a drug called Gleevec. Um, so this is a drug developed for a certain type of leukemia called chronic myeloid leukemia, or CML. And this type of leukemia is driven by, 95% of cases are driven by one specific genetic change. Two bits of uh, a chrome, two different chromosomes kind of become glued together and create this rogue molecule. And it's found in all the cancer cells. And Gleevec is a drug that basically targets the rogue molecule that's made by this, this fused gene. And it is, I think for my money, again, the most, probably the, the most successful cancer drug of all time. It turned CML from a disease that was almost universally fatal into one where today people who are treated with Gleevec have a life expectancy that is the same pretty much as people without cancer. And I think that is absolutely incredible. This, this is, it's not a cure because they still have cancer, but it is absolutely incredible drug for controlling the disease. The problem is, is it fooled us all into thinking that we'd be able to treat all cancers like this. And the problem is that cancer is, like I said, an incredibly evolving system. It's a very diverse system, just as we are patchworks of mutation. It's becoming increasingly clear that every single tumor is a patchwork of mutation. Every single person's cancer is an evolutionary one-off, a choose your own adventure of these cells diversifying, multiplying, mutating off on their own journeys. And that is what makes it incredibly, incredibly difficult to treat, particularly once it has got to an advanced stage. Um, the next slides, I'm going to show some medical images. So if you're, it, there's nothing like particularly gory, but some people you might find this upsetting, uh, particularly if you've known someone who's who's been through cancer, you might want to just kind of, you know, hop off, come back in about five minutes. Um, but just to warn you, there's some medical images. So this capacity of cancers to evolve was demonstrated, uh, I saw these results presented in 2011. It was demonstrated by the development of a drug called Vemorafenib. Now, this is a drug that was designed for melanoma, skin cancer, and it specifically targets the molecule that's made from a faulty gene that drives the melanoma cells to multiply. And this was like, this was incredible stuff. It was a really amazing targeted therapy that was developed. And this is, we can see, this is a photograph of a patient before he was given this drug. He has malignant melanoma and the lumps that you can see on his body are skin, are where the cancer has spread. They're, they're tumors all over the place. After just 15 weeks on this drug, I mean, it's just staggering. I was at a conference where these results were presented and you could hear that the noise in the room was like, <gasps> it was amazing. Absolutely incredible. But, you know, it was the next slide that really took our breath away because just eight weeks after that, this is the same person. Every single tumor has just come raging back. And this is the fundamental problem with trying to treat advanced cancers and particularly trying to treat them with this new generation of very, very targeted therapies that we have because they can give incredible results but they do not last because somewhere in there, the drug will have killed off cells that are sensitive to that drug. But once a cancer has got to a certain stage, somewhere in there, there will be cells that due to the genetic changes they have, will be resistant to almost any treatment that we can throw at them. And this is why I'm sure many of us will have been through that, that sort of heart sinking knowledge where someone is treated for cancer and then weeks, maybe months, maybe even years later, the cancer comes back. And if they're very lucky, there's another drug by that point where they can be treated again. If they're not lucky, then they're probably coming to the end of the road. And there's a, 
example in the book, I speak to someone who's very well known in the, the skeptics world, uh, Crispian Jago, who's now, I think, in his fourth or fifth year after a diagnosis of stage four kidney cancer. And he's been basically kept alive by this process that I call kind of whack-a-mole. So he's being treated with drug, his cancer is evolving resistance to the drug, and then he's moving on to the next drug and repeating this process again. And for the time being, he's doing really amazingly well. And it's, it's just wonderful to catch up with him and, and see how well he's doing. But his hope relies entirely on there being another drug when his cancer has evolved resistance to the one that he's on. And this is not good enough. We can't just keep playing whack-a-mole like this. We need to think of cleverer strategies. So one of the people who I think is really leading the world in this area is this uh, lovely, unassuming chap. He's called Bob Gattenby. He's one of the really kindest and nicest people <laughs> I've ever met. And he is a mathematician, a radiologist at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa in Florida. And he and his team are really digging into this idea of trying to understand the evolutionary processes that underpin cancer and resistance to treatment, trying to understand them using molecular mathematical modeling, using maths in the war against cancer, rather than just endless new drugs, and then trying to devise smarter treatment strategies that will enable us to steer the evolution of cancer where we want it to go, and potentially drive it all the way to extinction. And one of the ideas they're testing is something called adaptive therapy. And so this, the sort of the concept of this, hopefully if you've got any kind of engineering bent, this, this may be sort of obvious to you, but it certainly wasn't obvious to a lot of cancer researchers. But it's actually the same strategy that's been used to control things like pests in crops, because obviously pests in crops evolve resistance to pesticides. And if you've got a whole field of beetles that are now resistant to your pesticide, you have a lot of problems. So, you know, people in agriculture have been devising these strategies for control rather than what we try and do in cancer treatment, which is eradication, which does not work. So the, what, you're, what I'm showing you now is the kind of conventional idea of how we treat cancer, aiming for eradication. And the assumption is that in a cancer, you have a mixture of cells that are sensitive to the drug that you're using, is the purple ones, and cells that are resistant to the drug that you're using. They won't be affected by it. And you give a big dose of the drug, that's what MTD is, maximum tolerated dose. And that gets rid of most of the sensitive cells. And then you give another dose and that gets rid of most, uh, all of the sensitive cells. They're all gone, all those purple cells are gone. And then you give another dose. But all the time you're now treating the cells that are resistant to that therapy. It's not going to work and it was never going to work because they are resistant to that drug. And so that cancer, having shrunk and looked like it was working, that cancer comes back. And at this point now, all the cells are resistant to the drug. You either have to try something else or you are out of luck. Adaptive therapy understands this, appreciates it, and works with it. So again, we start from the same place. We have two populations of cells. We have cells that are sensitive to the drug and cells that are resistant to the drug. And what Bob is doing, he was doing this in a clinical trial of prostate cancer. And the important thing with prostate cancer is that you have a way of measuring how much cancer is in the body using a test called the PSA test, which is a, a sort of a readout of how much, how much cancer is, is in you, how many cancer cells are there. And, um, and also he was doing this with a drug called abiraterone. And men who are treated with this drug, it usually takes about 18 months from when they start the treatment to the point where their cancer is no longer responsive to it and it has progressed. So that's 18 months, the kind of target. And so what Bob does with this kind of treatment strategy in the clinical trial is that you assume that there are sensitive cells and there are resistant cells and you give men the drug and you wait until the burden of cancer, the amount of cancer that's in their body has halved. And then you stop treating you don't try and push it all the way down to zero because you accept and you know that that will never happen. You can't do that. You take it down to half and then you wait and you wait for the cancer to grow back. And when I talked to Bob, he was like, that was the hardest thing. The first time, the first patients that they tested, you know, trying to explain for a start that we're going to treat you and it's going to look like it's working and then we're going to stop 
I mean, that was a hard thing for them to get their heads around. Uh, and then to say, and then we're going to stop and we're going to wait for your cancer to grow back. Again, very hard thing to know as a, as a patient and also as the doctor treating them. But then when the cancer has grown back, the cells that have grown back are the sensitive ones because they are they are fitter. They're kind of uh, being resistant to drugs actually brings a, a, a deficit with it. Um, cells that are resistant to drugs and chemotherapy, they're actually less fit. So it's the sensitive cells that come back. You treat again. You wait for the level to drop. You stop treating. You wait for the cells to grow back. And Bob has had men kind of riding this roller coaster of treat, wait, wait for them to grow again for four years, when the average time to progression on this particular drug would be 18 months. If this was a new, fancy, very, very expensive targeted therapy, like this should be front page news for what he's managed to achieve in this trial. You know, it's absolutely incredible. And yeah, it's really hard to explain it and really hard to get people to take it seriously because they're like, oh, yeah, it's it's just one trial. It's just prostate cancer. You know, what, what do you know? Um, but there are trials in other cancers underway. The key thing to take this approach is that you must be able to monitor the cancer very easily. You must know how much you've got in there. And you also need to know what are the kind of the, the proportions of sensitive cells and resistant cells that you have. But resistance does eventually emerge. That's the problem. So all the people that Bob has treated, their cancers have eventually progressed, but he has bought them years more of life. And all the men in the study have taken far less drug overall than they would have done if they'd just been continually taking it. And they've had long periods of time when they haven't even been taking treatment at all. And they've had very, very good quality of life. So, you know, this is a very exciting approach, but it is still not a cure. And that's what we all really want, isn't it, right? We want cure. We don't just want to control. We want cure. We want to eradicate. So this is sort of the next stage. And there's Bob's working on lots of other interesting sort of evolutionary strategies to understand cancers at a genetic and an evolutionary and, and mathematical level and devise strategies to treat them. But what we really want to know is, can we actually drive cancer to extinction? Because if we're understanding cancer from this evolutionary perspective, rather than kind of the sort of nuke it from orbit, blast it all approach to treatment, what we're really talking about is a population of genetically diverse cells in an ecosystem, the body, and we want to drive them to extinction. And humans are unfortunately quite good at doing this to animal species and all kinds of like living things. We're doing it very well all over the planet. So we can actually look at how do you turn a species extinct and see what lessons we can learn to devise extinction strategies for cancer. And the example that Bob uses is the heath hen. So heath hens are kind of large, kind of turkey-sized birds. Uh, they were found all up the east coast of the US, and they were there for many, 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 uh, probably thousands of years uh, before the lovely colonial oppressors turned up and started hunting them. And so there's even a story that the, the first Thanksgiving turkey, very appropriately for this time of year, was actually a heath hen. And so they were basically hunted to the brink of extinction then there was one colony left on Martha's Vineyard, which is uh, off the, the east coast of the US. But as people started to move to Martha's Vineyard, as the area became more, more urbanized and more developed, the habitat for these birds shrank and shrank and shrank. They came down to a very small breeding population with low genetic diversity. And that is absolutely crucial. The less genetic diversity you have in your population, the less fuel you have for evolution to kind of, you know, MacGyver your way out of the situation you find yourself in. Having a very genetically diverse population, as we see in many advanced cancers, means you've got lots of genetic kind of uh, fuel to play with to try and devise and find new ways to thrive and survive. But when populations get down to low genetic diversity, they become very vulnerable. It's very hard to evolve your way out of trouble. Then there was a fire on their breeding ground. There were several harsh winters. And finally, there was a disease. And the last heath hen, he, he was sort of that rare that he had a name. He was called Booming Ben, was uh, thought to have died in 1932. 
So we can see that to actually drive something extinct, you don't just have one catastrophic event. You need to have multiple different types of things happen to you in like at just the right time to whittle the population down and eventually snuff it out. You know, we can think about the same thing. Everyone says, oh, you know, it was the asteroid that sent the dinosaurs extinct. It's like, dinosaurs are not extinct. There's dinosaurs nesting in the tree outside my window. You know, we birds are the remnants of the dinosaurs. Not all the dinosaurs died. Some of them survived and then they evolved and went off on their own journey. So really what we're talking about is extinction. How do you actually do this for cancer? And it turns out that we've actually done this kind of strategy almost by accident already. So childhood leukemia is a disease that was universally fatal in the early part of the 20th century. And now more than nine out of 10 children with certain types of leukemia, most types of leukemia actually will survive. It's been transformed. And a lot of this work started in the 1950s and 1960s with doctors like Sidney Farber. And they basically did it by trial and error. They were testing different combinations of drugs, different timings, different strategies. And it turned out that by trial and error, they had devised an extinction strategy for childhood leukemia. That you have one drug that works in one way, then you wait for another time, then you have another drug that works in another way, and you give another hit that works like this, and another hit that works like that. And so knowing what we know now, and knowing what we know about the kinds of populations of cells within tumors that we can tell from new genetic technologies, can we be a lot smarter about using the drugs we have to devise extinction, extinct, yeah, put my false teeth in, to devise extinction strategies? So, I mean, one very obvious thing is that often when people are treated for cancer, it'll be, they'll be treated with a drug and it looks like the, the tumor has shrunk and has gone away. But if we believe the evolutionary theory, there will be cells left that are resistant to treatment. And that drug is just not going to touch them. So why not go in then with another drug that works in a different way? And you'll have a much higher chance of knocking them out at that point. Now, we do give lots of drugs in combination, but maybe there are strategies where we can vary the timing, the mechanisms of how these drugs work to actually get a much more effective extinction strategy than we currently have for many types of cancer. And I was talking to a researcher who treats malignant melanoma, and she uses um, these new immunotherapy drugs, which I also think are very, very exciting. And perhaps we can talk about those later. But um, she's actually using these drugs before surgery to shrink down tumors. And then with surgery, it seems like afterwards, just whatever cells are left just seem to collapse and, and, and go away. So that's an interesting idea of like two different sorts of hits to get rid of these types of, uh, to, get, to basically drive these cancers extinct. So I think that there's some, some real kind of smarter thinking that is starting to come out from this more evolutionary way and more kind of cleverer way of, of thinking about cancer. But then ultimately, like this brings us to what's the end game? And, you know, I'm very sorry to have to tell you that we do all have to die of something. Uh, personally, I would very much rather that it wasn't cancer. I think it's a horrific disease. It takes people that we love from us. It causes unimaginable pain and heartache and it leaves even the people who survive, it leaves them scarred in so many ways for the rest of their lives. And I would like to see no one losing their life before their time to cancer. But when I went to speak to Peter Campbell at the Sanger Institute, I was like, well, you know, what, what's the end game? He's like, well, I guess it's that you, you die of something else first. Um, and this, I think it's, it's a hard kind of vision to sell because we've been sold this narrative of finding the cure, that we will live in a world free from cancer. And that doesn't work on two levels. It doesn't work because cancer is fundamentally hardwired into our biology. Like we are multicellular organisms that are subject to the rules of evolution by natural selection. Like you can no more declare war on cancer than you can declare war on multicellularity or war on evolution. It just doesn't work. And we will never be in a world where no one will ever get cancer again because, you know, it's just hardwired into our biology. It is the price that we pay for life. But 
you know, on the other hand, I think this idea that cancer can become a disease that we can control. In some cases, we can drive it extinct, we can eradicate it. And certainly if it is treated, uh, if it is found and treated early enough, we are having a lot of success there. You know, maybe we can all hope to live long enough to die of something else first. It's just not a very catchy marketing slogan, uh, unfortunately, for all the cancer charities. But I will sort of leave you with that thought. I will highlight that my book, Rebel Cell, Cancer Evolution and the Science of Life, is available to buy now from all good and all evil bookshops. You can follow me on Twitter and you can find all the links to the various outlets to buy it. You can buy, I've got some limited edition hardbacks and some uh, signed book plates that I'm selling through my website as well. And there's more info about the book there. So that's rebelcellbook.com. So thank you very much for your attention. That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Kat. You're right. It isn't a very good marketing slogan. You know, um, the solution to cancer is a heart attack. Well, I, this is the thing. It's, um, so I had, uh, when I was in the comms team at Cancer Research UK, I had a, some good friends who were in the British Heart Foundation, and it was a bit of a rivalry about who was killing more people. And, and because of the progress with things like statins that have and, and the reduction, particularly in smoking, that have really massively reduced uh, fatalities, mortalities from heart attacks. Mm. The, there was a point where cancer did overtake heart attacks as a leading cause of death. And they were yeah. like, yeah. And we were like, oh, <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah, that is basically the problem. Like, we do all have to die of something. Yeah. Um, I would just rather that it was like when I'm very old, happily in my sleep or through some yeah. wild yeah. sexual misadventure. Yeah. We're, we're beating cancer as a cause of death. It's a bit of a hollow victory, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, Cancer Research UK, live long enough to die of something else. It's, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the problem is it's a very complicated condition. This is because genetics itself is very complicated, difficult to explain to people. I had a, a conversation on the internet a couple of days ago with a creationist who said, that God built variation into Adam and Eve, and that's how all the different races of humanity came about. And I, I was forced to think, do I have to go back to explain to him that, you know, there, there are chromosomes and there are genes on the chromosomes, and we each have a pair of every chromosome. So there's only two possible genes at each locus at each bead position on the necklace that can give us any variability. And, and so Adam has two, possibly the same, and Eve has two. That's a maximum of four. So how do yeah. you know all the variations of humanity that we have out of that? Yeah, anyway. doesn't really work. <laughs> no, no, no. So that's just a problem. And a lot of people would say, I don't understand it, so maybe we should just drink bleach. Oh, God. Yeah, so um, uh, drinking bleach, not a good uh, way of curing cancer. I mean, the one thing that I have had that's similar to that is that I have had people saying, well, you know, if, if you're saying, if you're arguing that cancer is just inevitable and it's hardwired into life, then, like, why should we even bother? Like, let's just go down the shops, like, just get on the cigarettes and well, it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to get you in the end. It's like, that is not true. Uh, and the reason why is that there there are things that we know can reduce the risk of cancer and it is all the boring stuff like don't smoke yeah. all that kind of stuff but the question is why does that stuff work and uh, so there's quite a lot of in the book where I argue for really understanding what keeps our tissues healthy so yeah. there's two sides of a cancer emerging in the body so one is yes picking up genetic mutations in the cells so you want to reduce your mutational load don't do things deliberately that cause yeah. mutations and we know about many of those things things like smoking overexposure to the sun toxic Express. environmental chemicals all that kind yeah. of stuff so yeah don't do those things but yeah. then do things that keep your tissues healthy and reduce inflammation i think inflammation is a real key here so yeah. things like you know being a healthy weight exercise staying physically active yeah. all that kind of stuff so it's yeah. it's keep your tissues healthy reduce your mutational load and potentially you can push the incidence of cancer out by you know years hopefully decades to a much much later point in later life so you know it's 
it's not like, oh, it's not worth doing anything. It'll get you in the end. It's like, well, it would get you in the end, but I'd rather that it got me when I was like 95 than exactly. 65. When is the end? Let's postpone the end, shall we? Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, it, it is. Uh, my first wife died at 51 of, of cancer. She had the ovarian cancer, which mm. very difficult to detect until it's already too late. And so there is everything that we can do to improve survival length is, is obviously a big benefit. Now, uh, there was something you said earlier before we started the show. You said something like senescence is hell, cells having too much death. And cancer is cells having too much life. They just keep dividing again and again relentlessly. So the, yeah. the, trouble, the trouble is that that's sort of built in, as you were saying. This, these, these things are programmed into our genome. Yeah, this is, a, this is the really interesting thing, is that understanding that cancer is basically the price we pay for multicellularity and, yes. and, and evolution. It's, and, the, um, and there's a, quite a bit in the book, I talk about this idea of adaptive oncogenesis, which sort of explains why cancer is so much more common after the age of 60. It's not a steady line up by age. It is particularly after there's sort of an inflection point uh -huh. when we reach 60. And that does appear to be hard coded in mm. our evolution as species, mm. in our genomes. And there's a really interesting book that's coming out next year from a writer called Andrew Steele, and it's called Ageless. And he's been looking, it's, it's almost like the sort of companion piece to my book, because he's looking at aging and then how we might be aging and senescence and, and yeah. live for much longer and, and avoid all the kind of the, the sort of slow degradation of old age. Mm. Whereas mm. I'm sort of looking at, at, at cancer as the other point is where cells are kind of having, having too much life. Mm. And, you know, this is always a tough thing is that you want to, you want to kind of keep healthy and encourage healthy tissues and healthy proliferation. But if you tip too much over to the other side, then you do run the risk of cancer. And the older we live, just the more chances there are for, for that to eventually go wrong and cancer to emerge. Yes, but it, it, is it, it's not only carcinogens, it's not only mutations, is it? Because don't errors happen naturally? when in, in doing transcription so even if you lived in a i don't know a dark cave where there was no sunlight and no asbestos and you ate healthily and didn't expose yourself to any cigarette smoke you would still get cancer exactly and that's that's another kind of really key thing that i wanted to get across in the book is that i think often we do fall into this trap of blaming people for cancer mm. and and yeah it's absolutely if you lived a let's call it blameless you know but this perfect mm. perfect healthy life mm. uh y there is a non-zero chance and probably a reasonably high chance that at some point you would develop cancer because uh it's just an inevitable process of life and also <laughs> that we come with the genes and the variations that we inherit and some of those do make it more likely uh yeah. you sort of yeah. you know a couple of steps further down the road so things like the BRCA mutations uh, the breast cancer mutations that are passed down in families yeah that yeah. increase the risk of breast and ovarian cancers. There's probably a lot of other more subtle variations yeah. that we inherit mm. That, mm. that sort of help or, or hinder us there. So it's mm. it's absolutely, you know, I don't want to think that, you know, oh, if I never expose myself to carcinogens, I'd be absolutely fine. But yeah, if just being alive is, um, is, is a bummer, really, when it comes to your cancer risk. Uh, mm. Mm. Well, the other thing is that... Um, the genome is being increasingly investigated. The human genome, isn't it, is being decoded and a larger population is being investigated so that we may find more of these BRCA tendencies in future. Yeah, and it's not just about sort of looking at the human population. There's so much work going on now looking at cancer genomes, so the, the genetic changes in tumours and actually really breaking it down to understand this patchwork Mm. of genetic diversity within tumors now the techniques are sensitive enough and mm. try and tease out like can we figure out the rules the playbook mm. of this evolutionary journey that cancers go on so that we can steer it or understand it or predict it uh, in a better way and then how that interacts with the genetic changes and variations that, that we come in with 
mm. when, when we're born, you know, sort of the the, the, yeah. the tabula rasa that we start with in yeah, the true. genome, and then the, the evolutionary choose your own adventure that every yeah. every cancer goes on. Yes, I can see we've got. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I could say it's very important to choose your parents carefully. Well, yes, that's that does help. I was going to say there's a fantastic question um, from the Facebook user that you've popped up, yeah. but I do just want to ask before we run out of time. Um, so yeah, this is a question that how uh, we know many carcinogens. Can we not understand carcinogens by working out how these compounds affect affect cells? And there is exactly a project doing this that is a really incredibly exciting project. It's called the Mutographs of Cancer, and it's one of the Cancer Research UK's grand challenges. And this is a huge kind of multinational program of research and I was lucky enough to be invited to be a science writer working on that and I got to go to Kenya and I got to go to the Czech Republic and they're basically they're looking at uh, cancers from all over the world from five continents thousands of cancers mm -hmm. to really drill down to try and work out like the genetic scars that are left in the genome by different chemicals by different events just by the biological processes of life as well yeah. as external carcinogens mm. so looking for like the fingerprints of damage mm. and and then trying to pin that to what can we then understand about what's caused this and if mm. there are external causes then that leads us to real sort of prevention and and, and that kind of strategy so I, I wrote a big piece about it in the mosaic magazine for the welcome trust all about sort of the dna detectives so really? if you're interested in that, you can just uh, Google Google for me and you'll probably find it. And there's a, a, also a chunk in the book about that project as well, because I, I think it's incredibly exciting. Excellent. I'm copying and putting up some of your links here. I'll put them in the comments for the moment. Uh, why is that not working? Copy. Paste it. That's for your links. And... Uh, for the, for the benefit of the audience, I, I'd like to remind them that the archive is available. And uh, Kat mentioned birds that are, you know, survivors of the dinosaurs. We had an interesting show on that with Susie Maidment from the Natural History Museum a few weeks ago. And we also had an interesting show with uh, Mark Darcy on senescence and how we might live longer. So I'd like to encourage people to go to our archive on YouTube and have a look at some of those things. We've got another question here. Uh, do we think it will ever be a disease of the past? Uh, no, because for the reasons that I explained, cancer is a fundamental biological phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, it will only be not part of humanity if humanity stops being a multicellular organism. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. Like and this sort of idea that in the future, no one will get cancer. And maybe, maybe, maybe mm. if we can really understand what that process that enables rogue cells to emerge in tissues is. But I think the fact that we now know that just even healthy, normal tissue yeah. is yeah. a patchwork of mutated cells. I mean, that is just multicellular yes. life. Yeah. Um so yeah, I'd, I would like to see like early death from cancer certainly being something something from yeah. the past. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It it might not be caused is what you're telling us. It might be random errors in transcription. Yeah, I th I think um, well, there's all sorts of things that we know. Just fundamental biological processes of life mm. cause mm. DNA damage that mm. can contribute to to cancer. So we we absolutely know that, and that's some of the stuff that the Metagrass mm. project is actually throwing yeah. up. But yeah, this is this is just like I keep saying, it's it's the price of life. Yeah. But then what matters is like if cancer is always going to be with us, that what we have a choice about is how are we going to deal with it? What are we going to do about it? Yeah. And how are we going to push it further and further and further away mm. to, to much, much later in life as far as possible? Mm. In fact, the prospect is that we might get more cancer if the planet gets warmer because increasing temperature has a relationship with uh, it's like a mutagen itself. Is it? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Can... I've not come across that one. Haven't you? Oh, you can check it out yeah. on Google. I'll, I will. I will do. Go I'll do Google after this. But Google um, is my friend. <laughs> I hadn't. I hadn't overtly. Uh, overtly seen that one. No. Mm. Okay. I'll check it out myself, and we can, <laughs> we can compare notes. <laughs> if there's a skeptics in the pub, I'm going to raise a skeptical eyebrow and say that I will go and research that later. Okay, yeah, yeah, good. It's something I picked up years ago. I don't know how valid it is, but I throw it out there for you to consider. Right, now we've 
we've enjoyed you for an hour and we think that it's probably fair to let you have some time off so that you can fill that glass with gin rather than water. I've been gin already, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's water. We believe you. So I'd like to make a little commercial, if I may, before I thank you and say good night, which is that next week, who do we have? We have, um, uh, what's his name? Yeah, here it is on one, bit, one of my bits of paper. John Ostrowick, who is a philosopher who is now working for the South African government. So he, he'll be interesting to talk to. And following that, the week after that, who do we have? Uh, I think the week after that, we have Daryl Ray, who is a psychologist who set up um, Recovering from Religion Foundation. So we've got those interesting shows to look forward to in the future. Uh, can I encourage people to subscribe, to like, to share, to comment, to do all the things that YouTube is like. Smash the thing. subscribe button. I've done my commercial. <laughs> so, Kat, you've been wonderful. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. And all the best to you in your future endeavours. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye, everyone. I'll play the outro. Here we go.